Uh, my name is Laura Beard and I am the manager of family engagement at the Pritchard Committee. Um, I'm gonna start off with just um, an opening, but then let our distinguished guests um, introduce themselves when it's their, their time um, for the presentation. But we're gonna start off, at, first I thought I would put um, a survey in the chat, but we've been like throwing around links all day long. And so in an effort not to add another yet another link, let's just utilize the chat in a way to respond. And so what I really want you to think about are the barriers that you um, perceive exist for families to engage in roles um, in parent leadership or parent opportunities within your school district. What are some of the barriers? And if everybody can add at least one to the chat, that would be great. So we have a great list um, coming up here. We've got schedules, language barriers, confidence, time, knowing what the opportunities are, um, the power difference, authentic focused opportunities, attitudes regarding parent engagement, their past experiences, um, knowing what they don't know, childcare, lack of openness of the school to outside ideas. Does anybody have any more to add or do you have anything you want to expand on with your answer? All right, I'm going to attempt to share a little fun thing that we've done. Um, I manage the uh, and coordinate the Commonwealth Institute for Parent Leadership. For those of you who are familiar, um, it's a way for parents who really want to expand their uh, leadership confidence. Um, it's a way for them to meet with other parents across the state. We have monthly webinars. We talk about relevant topics related to education and um, parents complete a project as a part of their, their fellowship and graduation requirements. We have um, an English language learning SIPL that, that takes place in Northern Kentucky and is um, Boone County is a huge supporter. So thanks to the folks on the call today um, who support that initiative. But I surveyed parents within our SIPL group. And I know that as we survey more parents, this that these would change. But I just kind of want to show you um, in terms of like a survey says, um, let's see if this will work for me. Can you guys see this? Say survey says? Yep, yep. Okay, great. So I try to get creative. So sometimes that doesn't always work out, but this, these were our top five. And so it should shift here. And I was um, really, you know, glad to see that they pretty much line up with the things that were in the chat box. So time away from family. Um, that also included um, just that sometimes the times are when they're really needing to be focused on like, homework in the evenings, bedtime routines, um, you know, so even if we're accommodating like in the evening hours, they've still got a lot of things that are happening within their family, you know, supper time, different things like that. And so it's not just time away from family, but it's also interrupting some of those family schedules. Um, didn't know about the opportunity was a really strong second. And a, a few people mentioned that. And so um, I think we're going to talk a little bit about some strategies on how to make sure that that parents know that the opportunities exist. Don't feel welcome. 
And I want to expand on that one a little bit too. Um, I had a parent say, you know, I didn't, I felt like when middle school was over, I wasn't going to have to deal with that kind of cliquish mentality um, in adulthood. And it exists in adulthood and sometimes exists within our circles and our schools. So sometimes parents feel that they're not in that group. Um, and that was the terminology used. I'm not in that group. And so being aware of groups that kind of form within our schools and districts um, that are kind of perceived as those are the family leaders and we don't belong in that group. And I don't, you know, I don't know that um, that's the case for everybody who doesn't feel welcome, but um, that seemed to really resonate with a lot of other parents when that particular parent was sharing that experience. And then transportation is huge. I don't think there is a, a great solution that exists out there, but I think that there are some creative things that we can do um, as far as like where we meet, um, can we find a, a more centralized location if the school is not the location that works best for most families? I think some people have recognized that virtual meetings do help if people have access to internet. It, it does help. So we can't just ditch all of the virtual experiences um, if things turn, you know, go back to like that normal in-person meeting. Um, because we're engaging some parents we might not have otherwise done because of the transportation issue. And then a lot of parents just report feeling ineffective. And if I can take my um, family engagement hat off and put my parent hat on and just say that I can, I currently serve on an advisory council and I love my team of people and this advisory council is through our Family Resource Youth Service Center, but I think that the, the flux that we're in right now with the in school, out of school, um, parents are limited as far as their opportunities to come into the school building itself. We're meeting virtually. I'm doing a lot of like just voting on minutes and voting on budgets, but I'm not actually engaged in any work. And so when I think about, I'm feeling ineffective. So but I need somebody to ask me, what do you wanna do, right? Or um, I've offered, I've extended some of the things that I feel like I could do, but I'm not sure right now people know where to plug me in because it's really a tough time for family engagement, but it's also never a better time to engage families because we need to um, be innovative and we need to re-engage so that we can move beyond um, the, the challenges and barriers that this pandemic has, has brought forth. So um, any thoughts on the survey from parents? Any surprises? I mean, it seems like we were kind of in, in alignment. I think that there could be some perceptions that parents just don't want to engage. Um, I've heard that from educators before. I've heard that from community members before. Um, but when you talk to parents, there's usually a real clear reason, and they, they usually fall within the categories that we've kind of talked about today. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think that time away from family really kind of hits home and that, you know, we're trying to prioritize and juggle so much, and we try to prioritize our time with our kids. And if you can set up family engagement opportunities that maybe serve multiple purposes to help, um, with, to, to help eliminate that barrier. Thanks, Julie. All right, I, so I, I go ahead. No, it's fine, go ahead. If, if I put on a, a different hat here too, I think that that not knowing that an opportunity of a, is available is where um, the importance of communication comes in. I think schools think they do a really good job of letting everybody know what's going on, when it's going on, how they can help and all of those kinds of things. But um, I'm not sure that there is that intentionality to ensure that you're reaching that group of parents who have typically been unengaged. You always reach those families that are engaged, but it's getting to those families who are not engaged and being very specific about what the activity is or what, what, you, what it is. How can I 
it, it's not, oh, we're just having this big event, but what specifically can you do? What specifically is it, its purpose? And being really specific about what the opportunities are. Thank you, Catherine. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Penny. Dr. Fine, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Catherine Fine. I love her. Um, so hi, I am Penny Christian. I am, what am I? I am uh, Vice President of Leadership Outreach for Kentucky PTA. I am a Sybil Fellow. I am a member of the Pritchard Committee and I am a parent advocate. Most, well, most principals don't know me. So a lot of principals do who aren't even in Fayette County. Oh, by the way, I'm in Fayette County. Four girls. Um, the last one is actually a junior now. Um, and then yay, empty nest. Um, so my portion, my charge now is to discuss um, positive experiences that I've had with my principals. Um, and Kathy Fine was my first. Um, she was my daughter's elementary school principal. She just retired. So many kids are just gonna miss out on an amazing, amazing leader, administrator, educator, and friend. Um, I began my journey in PTA when my daughter was in kindergarten, first grade. Um, and from the beginning, Kathy was always visible. She was always approachable. Um, and this is, this is not gonna be a Kathy testimonial, but because she's elementary, I have to go to her first. Um, <laughs> but let me say that there was never a time that I did not feel that she welcomed and wanted families, parents in the building. Um, I've always been hands-on. My husband and I have always been hands-on. Like I said, she's the fourth. Um, so we, we have three that are adults and they're gone. Um, people who we didn't know knew us. And we understood that there were always going to be barriers. Let's be honest. I have four black girls. I knew that there were going to be barriers. Intentional or otherwise, some people were going to put up barriers. So what I needed in terms of family engagement was I needed someone who would listen to me. Um, and it wasn't just about PTA. Kathy Fine, I don't think ever told me no when I came up with a crazy PTA idea. But it wasn't that she never told me no. It was that I knew I could go to her. Right. When we um, we went through um, renovation when my daughter was there. And one thing Kathy hated was Dag Nabbit. When they put her office in, her office didn't face the front hall. Her office was in the back. So Kathy Vine took a little kid's desk and she put it out in the hall near the front door so that those babies would see her when they came in the door every morning. And she would sit there and had her little desk. It was amazing. Um, fast forward to middle school. Um, I've had three amazing principals. I was um, PTA president at Glendover, PTSA president at Morton Middle. Um, another person who from day one said, I need parents in the building. It's what we need for our babies to be successful. Right. So Kathy mentioned uh, communication. She had Fines Lines, which was her newsletter. Um, we had teachers in the middle school uh, who had weekly newsletters. Some were monthly. It really depended on the need. You know, once you're in middle school, you start to pull back a little bit on the communication because you're trying to get your kids some independence. Um, but they always communicated. And what I loved about middle school was in sixth grade. It was the most nurturing experience she could have had for transitioning from elementary to middle. Um, <clears throat> there wasn't, I, I believe in an open door policy uh, for, for principals because if they see you, they know you and they know what's going on in their building, right? Just sitting in the office all day doesn't really tell you anything. Uh, so let's go to high school who right now, I believe I have the model for what every principal should be in a high school, in a school period, but in high school, especially someone who embraces equity, someone who says, if I don't have a PTSA and parents in my building, I'm missing something, right? All of these things lead to lower behavior issues, right? Better academic success. All of these things, morale. There was always a very high morale at Glendover. Um, I, I can't say that every teacher loved Kathy. That's not the point, right? Okay. <laughs> But there was this feeling when you walked into the building, and I believe that you can tell what's going on in the building when you feel what you feel when you walk in, right? There were a couple of schools, you know, being PTA, I visited other schools and advocated for parents. And I'll tell you right now, I walked into the building and I felt the, just the breath leave me. I could feel the toxicity, right? So 
when we talk about positive uh, relationships and experiences with principals, we're talking about not just that administrator, we're talking about that administrative team, we're talking about the overall climate in the building, because all of this goes right back to the classroom and it manifests itself in the classroom, right? Uh, so let me say, everybody doesn't have the experiences that I have. I have been blessed. I have three amazing principals, three. I did not have one that I had to fight. Not in my building, I've had to fight others. Uh, but I'm gonna wrap up and I'm gonna say that uh, parents just wanna share we don't want to share the power. See, because sometimes we get territorial, right? There are some situations where principals say, ah, this, this person is a little, they're a little too aggressive and they're going to come in and they're going to try and change things. No, that's, that, it's not about power, right? It's about shared responsibility and partnership. So if I'm coming to you and I tell, I tell you, I tell my principal, there's a concern that I have. I'm not telling you you're doing your job wrong. I'm telling you that I have a wealth of knowledge per Dr. Karen Mapp and that I can help you with that situation, right? So that said, Dr. Fine, let's talk about how you felt and what you felt was needed to be successful in terms of that. Well, um, as I say, I'm Kathy Fine. I um, was the principal at Glendover Elementary in Lexington um, for 19 years. And um, I just recently retired, um, actually July 1. Um, when I began at Glendover, Glendover was a typical um, neighborhood suburban school, um, primarily um, made up of uh, university people. The University of Kentucky is nearby. We had university married students. We had uh, professors who lived in the neighborhood and it was just a typical suburban area school. About five years in, um, Glendover became a Title I school. And that was a huge, huge transition for Glendover. We had teachers who didn't wanna take the money because they didn't want to be quote identified as a Title I school. So we had a real paradigm shift about that time. And I think that's at the time when we really began to see the need for the importance of, of true family engagement. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you right now that our family engagement is perfect. But um, those people who know me know that um, my passion is, um, all students, but in particularly um, making sure that our, our ESL students um, and our ESL parents feel welcome in the building. Um, if I were to say what my forte is, that would be it. So when you ask me what is family engagement, I think we, it's such an overused word and it's not a word that can be, used, it can be done quickly. Building relationships takes time. Building genuine relationships takes time. And um, you have to, for these parents who are reticent or those people who feel like that, that they lack confidence to come in school, you have to build that confidence in them. You have to, to make sure that they know when they come in that you're glad they're there. And I think that sometimes as, as uh, educators, we tend, and, and Penny knows I, I speak my mind, so this may be a bad time. Um, but I think that there is this un, unknown little thing in the back of our head that often we assume that because a child doesn't speak English that they have no knowledge. And we've got to get around that. We have to start learning, looking at language as an asset and not as a deficit. Being able to speak more than one language is an asset people in this world. And so, you know, it's, it's a real little difference of, of shift. And when it comes to relationship, that when you are in a relationship with someone, it's sharing the good and the bad. So, so often all we communicate is when we have a problem. Every, every first encounter with a child and with a parent must be positive. It must be. Within those first two weeks of school, you must find a way to contact every parent and say, this is what's good about your child. Um, 
it's impossible for me to call 560 parents the first couple of weeks of school, but I made sure to try to call every the family of every child who was new to the building that year, especially first, second, and higher, because those parents often feel alienated. They weren't there right, you know, when they came in. So um, anyway, uh, getting getting back in, um, you know, I it, it just goes to say, unless you've got parent involvement, the child is not going to be successful. Um, their child, their success is going to be limited to the six hours they spend in your building. And that doesn't create success. Success is when it expands beyond that. And I think that right now it's just so important because I know that probably my middle and high school uh, colleagues would say at elementary, we're blessed because we get them when they're little and um, if we can catch them and get their language going and everything, then that that helps them be successful. But when a child arrives um, or as an, a non-English speaker, when they're in middle and high school, they've got barriers that are almost insurmountable. And they begin to say, what good is education? After I graduate from high school, I'm still gonna get a job in McDonald's. So what? You know, I might as well go out and, and, and make, make, um, make money now. So really, uh, for our lower SES families, it's really um, getting that value of education. And as a, as a community, we've got to find opportunities to help these children get um, beyond those barriers and be um, open to, um, you know, not necessarily going to just just going to college, but trade jobs and other things that are, are, are more than just McDonald's or car washes where you see so many of our, our people. Um, when Glendover first um, began to switch its paradigm, um, we had a big problem with teacher buy-in and that doesn't mean teachers don't care. Teachers' time has to be split between um, these, this growing demand for planning and preparation, for delivery of instruction, for differentiating instruction, for keeping, a, 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 you know, where children are right now. And so that makes it really difficult. Asking them to give up some of their evenings when it's their family time with their children is difficult too. And yet that's when many of our families are available to have quality um, conversations about their child. Um, we did have a barrier at Glendover. Parents were not really comfortable doing home visits. Um, so, you know, the early start teachers, ESL teachers, um, and all of those were really into home visits, but it, it was difficult to get teachers to do home visits. And I would say that's an area where we still, uh, where we still struggle. Once we decided that family, I'm, I'm a big believer in putting, I know I talk too much, um, Putting your, money, Mary, uh, putting your money where your mouth is. So um, what I did was um, the person at the front desk had to speak Spanish. It wasn't, it wasn't an option, they had to. And it's amazing what a difference that makes. But all of a sudden we had parents who were coming in to ask what a newsletter said or ask about some information we had sent home. So they knew they could come in and ask. Um, teachers began using a program called Talking Points, and this was before Zoom and everything came out. And Talking Points was an app where they could text families and it would translate it into the family's language and then translate it back to English. And it was that instant text opportunity that they were using. Um, of course, we, we got into to Class Dojo, but as an administrator, I began to use Class Dojo and I'd take a picture of a kid in the classroom and I'd dojo it to their parents right then. I was just in the class and look what Kathy's doing today. Um, and so we did that. The district purchased something called Language Line, which is, you know, where there are people on the line who will help you talk with parents who speak a different language. And um, so we used that. I think the, the most important thing that we did as far as our, and as I say, when you say put your money, Mary Martha, our largest gap area was our ESL students. They comprised most of our lower SES. Um, they provide, uh, composed many of our special ed. So if I, if I looked at my kids at the 40th percentile or below on math, they were almost all ESL students. So that was my gap. So that's what I had addressed. We increased our ESL allocation so that there was an ESL teacher at every grade level. I cannot even begin to tell you the value of this. 
those were the teachers who had the time to build relationships. Those were the teachers who, I mean, they knew their students inside and out. And not only that, they were no longer ESL teachers, they were teachers. They became members of the team. They planned with the teachers. They differentiated the, the content. They were not just language and teachers anymore, they were teachers. So while the teacher, the kids were increasing their language acquisition, they were increasing their knowledge of content. And that is the only way that you can, can begin to help help those children because as we all know, they kind of plateau. Um, we started holding events in the neighborhoods where we had you know, books distributed, PTA was there, administrators were there, parents came out. We had kind of like a little party in the neighborhood in the parking lot. Um, and so parents knew. We always made sure interpreters were available at all events. Science fair information night, open house. We had them everywhere so that parents uh, felt comfort, um, comfortable. We conferenced, um, uh, we had group conferences. So parents who had a first grader, a second grader and third grader could come in on one night for conferences. Um, so how did that impact us? ESL is now an integral part. Teachers now will choose to keep their ESL teacher at the grade level and take on higher class sizes so that they can do that because they feel it, that partnership is so important. The ESL teachers know the kids so that the instructional time is lost. They don't have to spend time, oh, where is this kid every year kind of reevaluating. So it, um, it really has, it was a big, big boon for Glendover. And, um, and if I were to say what was my biggest success as in my tenure during that time, it was making the community of English language learners feel a part of a school community. And Kathy, um, I'm thinking back to our international nights, mm -hmm. right? And I'm thinking back to these times where I saw, and it was brilliant to have Barbara, whoever the Spanish, the, 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 time, the, the, the front office, these Spanish. Um, those parents would come in with a look of comfort with a look pride. of confidence. Yeah, pride, yes. Knowing pride. that there are the people that are looking at go, why are you here? Yes, absolutely. And it made all the difference. And as the PT, as PTA, I was able to be able, I was able to get those parents to volunteer and do things that they never thought they were being willing to do because one, they were never asked. Mm -hmm. And two, they didn't feel comfortable. Right. So um, this is why I, I, I asked her to speak because. Sometimes when we think about family engagement, we have, you know, we have, you're right, it is used a lot and sometimes overused. What we have is family engagement, we know leads to better academic success, but you know what? It's so much more than that. And when you talk about those relationships, I don't remember the percentage of ESL, of ESL kids we had in the building, but it was high enough. It's about 25%. About 25. That's, that's huge. Right. So, um, no, we're here till 210, you guys. We're not done in two minutes. Um, I'm done. In <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, but uh, and I'm going to give it back to Laura. Um, but thank you, Kathy. And um, if you all want to talk to Kathy later, just let me know and I'll connect you guys. Laura. Thank you, Dr. Fine. Um, we are going to have a question and answer time, so um, we'll revisit some of this conversation. Just a reminder, this is an hour long, so we actually end 10 minutes earlier than the next breakout session, just because we're not taking a break right now when other folks are. So we're going to continue on um, with Julie Pyle, and um, I just want to let Julie and James know that we're both... Um, are you both have the time that you need? We've got ample amount of question and answer time I think that we can dip into. So this has been great so far and, and take all the time you need. Thanks. Okay, great. So um, Penny started us with the positive stories. Jim's gonna be shocked because I'm starting with the negative story. Um, Jim was actually my principal at the elementary school but he didn't become my principal until, I forget if Sophie was in first grade or second grade. Um, so my experience was when I was a kindergarten parent and I wanted to be involved, but I was working full time. I had a kindergartner. I, I very much value education. A um, little bit of background. Uh, I've been a PTA president. I run a nonprofit called Parent Camp and I'm on the school board here in Boone County, Kentucky. So education is extremely important to me. And I wanted my children to understand that. 
so I went to my first PTA meeting and I remember we were sitting in the cafeteria and the board was sitting at the tables up front and parents were in the back. It was the normal kind of compliance type situation. But the board, people on the board would just talk and nobody introduced themselves. And it was, it wasn't the most pleasant experience because they made the assumption that they were important and everybody knew who they were. And being a new parent had no idea. Um, so that went on for a couple of months. Um, there was a, another meeting where we were in the library and they were talking about they needed to have the PTA wanted a website and to do some social media. And at that time I was actually doing that in my job. And I'm like, well, I can help do that. That's something I can do from home. Um, then uh, at that point, our school was the largest elementary school in Kentucky. We had, I believe 1200 students and it was quite big and overwhelming. Um, but then that next year we were basically split in half. And at that point, Jim came along and became our principal and um, just it, it completely changed. He completely changed the culture of the school because he himself is very welcoming and open. Um, something that I learned as I moved on into different roles with our PTA was the importance of making sure you, when somebody walks in the door, a parent walks into a door to an event, if you don't know them, ask them their name and then always say their name when you see them. It's acknowledging them, you know, then they know they're valued, they're part of the community. As um, a lot of times what happens with PTAs is they become cliquish. And as the leaders of the PTA, you wanna make sure that whoever is in the leadership role really um, gets the message across to whoever the leadership is of the group that, you need to split up and not be cliquish. You need to get out and meet everybody in your community and let get to know them, find what skills and passions they have. So that way you can start finding ways to plug them in because then they feel valued, then they become invested in the school. So um, I'm gonna kind of pull Jim in here and we can kind of talk about our relationship and his values and how things, uh, how he was able to help turn that culture of the school. Um, his last year there was probably, I think Jim and I would both agree, probably one of the funnest years of our lives. We had so much fun because we had so many parents coming into the school saying, what can I do? And we were starting to have to create things <laughs> to find things for them to do because we had so many volunteers. It was amazing. So. Yeah, well, thank you, Julie. I would agree. I, I think I'm in my 25th year in education, and that year was by far the most rewarding of my career. So thank you. I'm Jim Detweiler. I'm the Chief Academic Officer, W Superintendent for Boone County Schools. Um, I've been in central office, I think, eight years now. I was an elementary school principal for 11 years, five of those years at Stevens Elementary School with, um, with Julie. I'm really glad that Julie used the word culture because I think that you know, if I had to give some advice to other principals, young principals coming up in terms of building leadership within parents is to remember that parent engagement is not an event. You know, it's an integral part of the school culture and the school culture is really massaged and built with the school leadership, starting with the school principal. And I think I realized that the hard way early on in my career when I was a principal in New York, but was able to bring those experiences to Kentucky in my role at, at Stevens Elementary School. Um, one of my favorite things to say to staff even today is, and I'm sure you've heard this before, is culture eats strategy for breakfast. It doesn't matter what we put into place in terms of strategies uh, that are, that are research-based strategies. If the culture is not fertile, those strategies aren't going to take root. And so we, Julie and I worked on that a lot together. We were a great team. Um, I also realized, and I think this is good advice for, for newer principals too, is that you know, my relationship with parents as a principal is important, but the most important relationship, I think, is between the parent and the teacher, especially at the elementary level. And th that relationship has got to be solid. So I did a lot of work behind the scenes, working with the teachers, trying to get them to challenge themselves when it came to student, uh, parent engagement. An example of that would be, and Julie's heard this story a thousand times, you know, when it came time to hire teachers, I would throw in 
you know, I would with the site based council and, and our consultation committee, I would make sure we had questions about student engagement. One of my favorite or, or parent engagement. One of my favorites was, will your parents be involved, engaged, or empowered? And of course, to all of us on this, you know, on this in this setting, I think the answer is all of them. You want them to be all of those things. But it really challenged some of the teachers right at the front. You know, the, many teachers would say, oh, we don't want our parents to be empowered like not really understanding what that word meant. You're not understanding the benefits to the community, the benefits to the student that if we empower parents to be leaders and we empower parents and give them the tools to help their students thrive and learn in an academic setting, the kids are gonna win out. And that's what we're all about. We're about the kids. So, you know, that cultural piece and really challenging the teachers. I also would try to model as much as possible. And I used to say I would model in a resonant way, like in a big way. So that the teachers would see me doing things that were maybe kind of far out there with parents, um, just to say, you know, we've got to do more than we're doing. This is not an event, it's part of the culture. And as your principal, this is what my expectations are and this is how I live my life. Um, I guess I would also say that, you know, that sense of belonging, somebody else mentioned that earlier, it might've been you, Penny, that, that, that phrase sense of belonging, we use that, that phrase for students a lot, but it goes for everybody in the community. The, the parents need to make sure that they, we have to make sure parents feel like they belong as well. And that they're part of those decision-making processes, not just the easy, easy problems, but the hard ones, because that's where you really build their capacity to contribute in a meaningful way and feel like they belong in a meaningful way. Um, I would encourage questions. You know, Julie's on the school board to this day. I, I, I love that the school board asks questions. I would say to parents, ask me the hardest questions you can. We're all going to learn by the hard questions. If we shy away from the hard questions, we're not going to do any good. Um, and then one last thing I'll say, you know, go really reach out to those parents who are probably your biggest critics. Two of Julie's, you know, partners in crime really were not, they were not, they did not really care for me at the very beginning of some of the decisions that I made. But, you know, coming back to them and really working through problems with them, today they're probably two of the biggest advocates I know that work with the schools. Both of them, um, one of them doesn't have students in the district any longer, but still volunteers in the school and is a leader in the school and really embraces the parent engagement and parent empowerment concept. So I'll stop talking there, but you know, Julie, Julie was a great partner. I learned a lot from her and um, really honored to, to be part of that parent engagement movement that she has in place. So we have um, two more agenda items for our presentation today. One being a question and answer time for our, our uh, group of panelists. And then also we're gonna share a tip sheet that we're adding to, um, we started to just nail down some concrete strategies. Um, some you may have heard today that we need to add. This can just be a document where you can share or you can learn from. So we'll just go on into our, um, since this is fresh on our minds, let's just go on and open it up for um, questions. Here's a question for all of you. Um, when you were at the beginning of building relationships with parents who maybe weren't sure about coming into your building or what the relationship with you as school leaders might be, what were some of the specific things that you did to create that warm welcome? I'll provide a quick example. You know, um, you know, today it's a little more common to have dad's groups in elementary schools, but it wasn't when we were at Stevens. When Julie and I were there, that was unheard of. And um, we actually, had, we had a rock star teacher, uh, Chad Cadell, who was really also very much into parent relationships, very much into uh, uh, parent engagement. And so we designed an evening for parents, to, or for dads, just for dads to come, or a day. They came in in the morning, they came into the classrooms. I probably would guess 75% of those dads hadn't, hadn't yet been in the classroom, hadn't seen their first grader in the classroom. Um, so we created this safe space for them to come in with their children that we took them all into the gymnasium and talked about their past experiences as kids themselves. I've never seen so many grown men cry in my life. I mean, they were so moved by this idea that they had had bad experiences as kids in schools. They never thought that they'd be invited into an elementary classroom to see what their own children were doing and to include them in such a proactive way um it was powerful it was powerful and we we continued to do that throughout my tenure there so i would just offer that up as an example 
Yeah, I think one of the things that I did as a parent leader and I still do today is I will go and invite people just to meet up someplace, meet for lunch, meet for a cup of, I don't drink coffee, but you know, for coffee or a, a donut or something and just sit and have a conversation to get to know them and their family, to build that relationship and to build that trust. And you can only do that one person at a time. So it, it does take time, but the benefits and the ROI on taking that amount of time just comes back tenfold. Kathy? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, good, because I can't see myself. I did something to the screen and I have no <laughs> idea where I am right now. Oh, we so can I see can't you. see anything. Um, I just didn't know if I could be heard. Um, at, uh, many years ago, um, and I know that I have been blessed with opportunities that a lot of people have not, but Fayette County did something called the Ultimate Home Visit. And for three weeks, I went to Mexico. I lived with a family. I um, went to school in classes at one of the universities. We visited hovels that made, I mean, that made our, our low SES um, areas look like palaces. I mean, it was an amazing experience. And I just went because I kind of wanted to know a little bit more about education in Mexico. But when I came back, parents just, I mean, always, you went to Mexico? You went to Mexico? You, it was like you cared enough to go to Mexico. They were just so amazed that I had done that, that, um, it was kind of the turning point for me to see. And um, I began to notice that I couldn't speak a word of Spanish and they couldn't speak a word of English, but we could talk to each other because I understood Spanish and they understood English. And we would sit across the table and talk to each other with no interpreter, but we knew what was going on. And, parent, and I knew that, that we were being successful the first time I had um, a Hispanic mother came in to me to complain about a teacher. And I know that we go, oh my goodness, you know, they're complaining about teacher, but they felt comfortable enough to come in and advocate for their child. I thought that that was one of, I mean, to me, that was one of the greatest days of my career. I have, I have a question of Kathy and Jim. Um, you know, we've, we've known this works for so long. What, why do you think it's not sinking in across the board with all school building leaders? What are the obstacles that are keeping us from happening that we can address? I'll just offer two quick thoughts, Cindy, Cindy. And it kind of also goes back to, to Jenny's question, you know, building relationships, like any relationships, I think it requires the leaders and the teachers to show a certain amount of vulnerability. Like, I don't think that you can build parent engagement that's strong or empower parents in a strong way if you yourself are not vulnerable enough to go to the parent and sometimes say, I don't know, I don't have the answer, help us, help us, you know, that kind of thing. And I think that's, that is really difficult in the fast pace of today's education for people to kind of take a breath, for leaders to take a breath, for teachers to take a breath, to say, I, ha I have time, I can be vulnerable, we can do this. Um, you know, we often, and the other, the second one is no big surprise. We talk about, you know, school accountability, state tests, et cetera, although that, that conversation seems to be turning in a good way, I still think that my teachers here, uh, my principals here would point to that as, they would never articulate that as an excuse, but I think in their minds, it's something that is still up really at the front. It takes up a lot of space. It takes up too much space. And the relationship stuff and the parent engagement stuff, unfortunately, takes the back seat. That's, that's just my, my gut reaction to your question. Um, I think it's a time thing. I mean, I do think time plays a big part of it. Um, the teachers don't feel like they have the time to, to spend, to take, to, to really build that strong relationship. I would, I would counter with, 
if the people in your building who are not classroom teachers take the lead in building that relationship, the if you think about it, the principal, assistant principal, counselor, your PE teacher, your art teacher, your music teacher, those are the teachers who will know your child for their entire elementary school career. If you can begin to get parents to feel comfortable in your building through PE programs, music program, the things that do involve the whole school. Those are the teachers who can plant the seeds of your welcome in this building. And then it's not up to each teacher each year to try to build that relationship all over again. Parents will feel comfortable coming into the building and they will be comfortable with each teacher as they come along. But those people who know all the kids all the time are going to be the ones who can really get that comfortable feeling, uh, that group feeling comfortable in your building. Parents have to know they're welcome. They just, they just have to. And um, if they don't feel welcome, then accountability won't mean anything because you, you're just not going to get there. Um, I will say that, that the program with getting as much ESL support as you can, or whether right now with money coming out of people's ears from um, COVID money, um, getting, we've got to start looking at intervention and those kinds of things differently. Um, pulling a child out of a classroom to do something different, to go back in a classroom where they don't know what's going on yes, doesn't work. Right. And so the more people that you can have to, and when, when academic success begins, the children get proud, they take it home to their parents, their parents want to share it. It's just a big circle. And, um, but I think that the people who are the, who are, who know the kids the best are those the ones that, that have them their whole career. Laura, if I, I just want to pounce right quickly. Well, piggyback, I should pounce. Um, something Mr. Detweiler said when he talked about what pushes this family engagement to the, to the back. Um, I've heard this. I've had conversations with principals. I've had conversations with teachers. And there's this blame game that goes on, right? So the teachers blame the parents. The principals blame the teachers. Frankfurt blames everybody and somebody's gonna be held accountable, right? So I've literally heard principals say, I don't have time because I have to worry about test scores and I have to worry about them coming in for my observation. I don't have time to build those relationships. Literally that was said to me. It, it made me twitch um, because I had the counter for that, right? So this notion, and part of the, you know, we can go all the way back to Kara if we want and talk about accountability and who's to blame for what. And when this school is challenging, who is generally at fault and who's going to suffer for it or someone who's going to be punished for it, right? So you're absolutely right that other stuff gets in the way. But Kathy, you brought up the point that, you know what, accountability doesn't matter. And you're not going to make these, these strides that you want to if you push us out. Right. So it's interesting. It's an interesting issue. If I could ask a quick question of the group, um, this has been uh, brought to my attention recently. Um, as I mentioned that we're engaging some English language learners in, in northern Kentucky around leadership positions. So this is this is really to speak to parents who want to serve on committees or councils. Um, the struggle is, is that um, schools are, are now recognizing minority representation but they're wanting to fill the spot. And I say the spot um, because they feel like, well, we just add the spot and that's a check mark. And parents are, are quick to realize that they don't want that burden, right? I mean, they don't wanna be the minority represent, representative to carry the burden of um, the folks they're supposed to be representing. And also it's, it really gives them a disadvantage to be included into a group that has been meeting, always met, um, and quite frankly, I don't think a lot of our schools are set up with the language justice tools in order for parents to really be um, a valued member at the table and have the tools and resources they need. So any suggestions on um, as schools, and I think it's, it's great that we're looking at who are we missing at the table, 
But to think that we just fill that spot, check mark that box, this token position, um, how can we be more mindful and be more um, intentional when we're recruiting? And then it being systematic. So like as an example, if we were to have a Spanish speaking parent come to a school board meeting, there's no interpreter there. We wouldn't know what they were saying and we couldn't communicate back. It's not standard procedure to be able to have those supports in place. And I think we, we missed the ball on, on doing that. Well, um, and you know, I say we're, we're probably lucky enough in Fayette County that we do have that. We have, like, we have a lot of resources as far as it comes to translating and, and interpreting things. But to me, there's a, there's a bigger question a minority rep does not represent minorities. There are too many minorities in your building. Um, Penny might know um, how to respond to certain issues, but they may not apply to, you know, a family member who is, you know, immigrated here from Nepal and has trauma coming out of there, you know. So um, I think that, um, I, I've always I've always been a had a little bit of a problem. I came from North Carolina. We had councils. They didn't have the power that councils have in Kentucky, I don't think. But we were able to increase our representation. So I knew that I could have more than four people on my council or something like that. And um, that's where I think that. And you know, I don't know your your success, but we had very very little success with getting parents involved on our committees as well, because of either the times they met or the parents that wanted to be involved were the parents who wanted to come in and talk about giving candy out as a reward, you know, or taking away recess as punishment. And so the conversation wasn't really around those critical issues. It was more of agenda items. Um, so I, I don't, it's really a difficult question of how to, how to get, parents involved most parents who are in those uh, classifications feel like they don't know enough to contribute and so you ask for input on a scare a parent improvement plan a school improvement plan it's how can we help your child be more successful in school they have no idea they, and and so it, it's a it's I think it's really a, a difficult thing to do and family engagement is more than participating in after school activities. And I think that, that that's another question we miss. Family engagement is truly engaging a parent in a partnership to help their child be more successful. And that comes through frequent two-way communication that is at a personal level. Thank you, Dr. Fine. Um, we're going to move into um, just looking at a document here, um, tools um, or tips just for um, increasing family leadership. And when we talk about leadership, we're talking about that individual leadership and also leadership as we're um, kind of building a pipeline for parents to serve in decision making roles and to really um, help um, further student success. So I'm going to share this link. And that way um, you guys can add to it. So it should be open for edits. Um, there are some great books that you'll see in the document if you're able to open it. Let's see if I can share it with you guys. We included um, some books that folks are using in our learning network for family engagement right now. So I just like took a sna snapshot out of the image at the bottom if you're wanting to look more into um, those books available. And then we started kind of a list amongst um, the parents uh, around some, some strategies. And so I think I just wanted to point out that one of the resources that, that I added to your grid for um, EdCamp is a document we put together on the positions we know that are available statewide for parents to engage in. Um, this is something we try to highlight once a year with parents in our um, Commonwealth Institute for Parent Leadership webinar. And 
they're just amazed that they didn't know that some of these opportunities existed. So I would encourage you to just kind of look at the document. It's nothing but a list and, and contact information on how, um, how to fill out an application or even Julie has spoke about like building confidence to run for school board. Um, and we're talking about we're talking about this ladder of engagement where, you know, we've moved parents into a place where they're confident to serve in some of these decision-making um, roles. So um, I would just encourage you to think if you don't have one for your local um, area or school, maybe put one together. So you can take some of those state opportunities, but then plug in the things like if you have an ambassador program, if you have open spots um, in some of the, the um, groups and councils that meet locally at your school, I would encourage you to add to that. So just open it up for a conversation. We've got like four minutes around tips um, for family leadership and engagement. We're really talking about the entire pipeline here of, of how families engaged on a spectrum. It starts with a relationship and then it moves. So, um, I, I think it's really important to identify, I'm sorry, I know I talk too much. You can tell I don't work anymore, can't you? Um, <laughs> anyway, um, there is a leader within each of those groups. You may not know who it is, but if you can identify, like we had a, a huge Arabic population and we have a huge Hispanic population. If you can um, and there is there is a parent in each of those groups that you see at school all the time. And if you can leverage them to be your voice with that community, that is is really helpful. Our our um, our parent ha happens to be Jessica Sanchez, who is now the is oversees all the interpretation and translation in Fayette County. But I hired um, Jessica and she was a parent in my building. And so she was fluent Spanish speaker, yep. but she was a parent of the children in the building. So find that leader, that parent leader with that group, and then leverage that parent to help you reach the others. Thank you. And something that, that was brought up um, amongst our parent group was that recruit based on talents, you know, like yeah. parents have certain talents. And so um, recruitment can sometimes be just a general flyer, like we need parents to do X, Y, or Z, but using like things like phrases like calling all artists or calling all business owners or really calling out what talent you're looking for with parents. Um, and then um, our parents overwhelmingly say personal invitations make all the difference. If you recognize, like Dr. Fine said, if you recognize a strength in a parent, um, calling that parent up and saying, you know, I, I really appreciate that work you've done on whatever it might be. And I really think you'd be great for this opportunity and share it with them in that way. They're more likely to check into it and possibly um, possibly take the invitation. Why do you think I'm here? <laughs> I'm retired. Have you ever tried saying no to Penny? Love you. <laughs> never, never. <laughs> terrible, terrible. Um, I know we have two minutes. I just can, can I just address one where it says acknowledge biases, preconceived beliefs, or, and our ideas about the ideas about why families may or may not participate. Guys, there's not a person on here who does not have at least one bias. We probably got a couple of dozen. We need to acknowledge those, check them at the door when we walk into the schoolhouse, but acknowledge that we have biases. I've experienced those biases. I've been the mad, the angry black woman who's just causing trouble in the building. I've walked into a building where I've had to fill out information and they just assumed that the, that the child's father was not in play, right? We all have those biases. Find out where those biases began, see how well they've served you so far, and then realize maybe I need to check some things. It's not a bad thing. That's called cognitive dissonance and growth comes from that. So acknowledge those biases and use them to leverage growth. Thank you, Penny. And if you're on the call and you have something to add to this tip sheet, feel free. Um, to stick it there on, on our tip sheet and we'll love to include it and um, get your feedback. So as I mentioned, um, we're at the 210 mark, which means that we're wrapping up for the day. Um, I wanted to just thank everybody for joining us. Um, this has been great. This is my first experience with EdCamp. It's been wonderful. 
Um, and we hope that you'll check out our resources that are in the grid and connect with us in the work we're doing um, to increase family engagement across our state. Thanks, Laura, and, and everyone who participated. It was really um, powerful to hear different voices from different perspectives. Um, so it was great. So we will stop the recording and you guys are free to go. But um, thank you so much for coming today and for sharing and being so open.